Thank you, Matthew. That was beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're a little short in numbers, but long in faith, right? Amen. Amen. You're just speaking too much in the front yet. Everybody left. I know. <laughs> well, every Sunday we play hide and seek. He hides the announcements and I seek them, and it's always a fun way to start your morning. And if you seek, you find. <laughs> Okay, first of all, UMW is selling tea towels made by our own Bernice Barker today after both services in the archives room back on the table. As you all know, Bernice is 106 years old and has faithfully used her expert embroidery skills on tea towels for many, many years. She has informed us that this would probably be the last year to do so. You don't want to miss this opportunity to purchase some of her beautiful work. Back there on the table after the service, please come see them. Prime Timers will meet this Tuesday at 5.30 in the FEC. Anyone age 60 and over is invited to join. Trustees Committee will meet Wednesday at 6 back in the archives room. Staff Parish Relations Committee will meet Wednesday at 7 in Pastor Dave's Sunday School Room. Fall Festival, that's coming up pretty quickly, Saturday, October 31st, 5 to 7, in the parking lots on the north side of the church. We will plan to have the street blocked off and games set up in each. What we need is six groups to set up and work the games. The education department has some games that you could use or come up with your own, and we will provide individual bags of prizes, candy to hang, and to hand out. Please contact Connie at the church office to let her know if you can help. This is always a fun evening, especially for the kiddos. Methodist Men Breakfast is held every Wednesday morning from 6.30 to 7.30 in the fellowship hall. Invite a friend, join these guys for good fellowship, food, and devotion. Yes, yes, yes. Early Watch Prayer Woo! Group meets for fellowship, worship, and intercession Monday through Saturday mornings, 5 to 6 in the chapel. Please join when you can. Visitors, please fill out a visitor card located on the back pew and drop it in the offering chest or text your contact information to Pastor Dave at 580-649-9190. I love giving his phone number out every week. <laughs> Anything else, sir? Yeah, Lord, here am I, St. Vicky. When they call me, I'll say, You're, uh, you're mean. I do have a quick announcement. Yes, sir. Don and Sybil Heiss have been kind enough to take our uh, supplies and gifts down to Louisiana. They tried to do that, but another hurricane came in, and uh, they had some tire trouble. They had to turn back. <laughs> but they will be, le be leaving on the 23rd and uh, take, a, hopefully, a smooth, problem-free trip down to Creole, Louisiana with the trailer loaded to capacity. Uh, if you'd like to make a financial gift, just make it out to the church for the Louisiana hurricane victims. And uh, we'll be sure to get that money to Don and Sybil on Friday so they can take it down with them. Uh, that whole area of Creole has had total damage. There are no standing buildings. Uh, they're gonna set up a tent and they're gonna offload the trailer and people can come and get uh, whatever we've been able to give to them. Uh, so if you would still like to do something toward helping our neighbors down there, just make the check out to the church and we'll be sure to get that into Don and Sybil's hands. They're thinking that the ma majority of the finances will be given to a school. There is a school that's going to reopen, the only school in the area, and most of those kids are homeless. Most of the supplies have been lost, so they'll need food, they'll need school supplies so if there are any vital needs that they come across they'll help folks out where they can but they're going to most probably give most of that money to the school to help students so thank you for all who've helped so far some monies have already come in come in and we've given those to don and sybil whatever else comes in this week we will give to them they'll take the trailer load and their big expedition that's loaded and uh, take all of those gifts just to share the love of Christ with our neighbors down there. 
they could really use finances down there right now more than anything. And we want to especially lift up Don and Sybil as they travel and do this wonderful deed in representing our church. Yes. So God is good. All the time. And all the time, God, God is good. So please join me now for the call to worship. From the beginning of our human history, God has made appointments with us. Adam and Eve had a daily appointment with God in the cool of the day. God uses these appointments to reveal his presence, purpose, and power to us and through us. Appointments with God bring conviction, transformation, and blessing. God promised to send us a savior. In the fullness of time, God fulfilled his promised appointment by sending us his son, born of a virgin, who would save us from our sins. Like Jesus, we are called by God, sent by God, and used for God's kingdom. Almighty God, please set up divine appointments for us. Send us wherever you need us and whoever needs to hear your gospel or experience your love. Now let us prepare our hearts and mind for worship. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing, Send the Light. seated. For those who are seated in the second half of the church, it is really good <laughs> to see you in worship this morning. I'm glad to be a part of worship. We call this corporate worship. We all have opportunity to worship individually or with our families at home when we do devotions or when we have opportunities maybe just to read scripture together or listen to a program that encourages us in our faith. But it has been the practice of Christians all the way back to the times of Christ to gather for worship corporately with others like this. So welcome and what a joy to be able to have the light of Christ shining in our lives. 
Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He comes and illuminates your life and mine and then through us, he shines that light to others. And it's in your words and it's in your deeds. God takes us and makes us new creations in Christ. What a blessing to be a part of that this morning. Please join me this morning in our prayer in unison as we focus on this theme of divine appointments. In God's sight, a person is the most precious of all values. This truth possessed Jesus and never let him go. He thought it, taught it, and lived it with full devotion. He illustrated it with stories of the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son. Every individual is inherently worthful to the Father. Every child, everywhere, of every race, of every condition. Love requires response, and parenthood craves companionship and cooperation. Therefore, every human being on this globe is indispensable to God indispensable in the sense that God can never be fully himself without loving comradeship and he can never complete his work without faithful cooperation from every individual everywhere. Jesus taught and lived the twin truths that man needs God and God needs man, which is to say parents and child are so bound together that cleavage is disastrous. No idea could be further from the mind of our Lord than the persistent doctrine that God is so transcendent, so holy, so sovereign, that He is unknowable, inaccessible, and unresponsive. In the prayer which He taught His disciples, Jesus makes it clear that men should carry all their needs to the Father, even a petition for the satisfaction of daily bodily requirements. Jesus knew men to be frail, sinful, easily corrupted, sometimes monstrously depraved, capable of cruel and atrocious behavior, but always, always, always a child of God, And even when a prodigal, indispensable to the lonely and yearning heart of the Father. Amen. That particular reflection prayer was written by Catherine Marshall. She was the wife of Peter Marshall. If you've never read the life story of Peter Marshall, it's most encouraging. They made a movie of it. I think it was called A Man Called Peter. If you've never watched that, I commend it to you. After he died, Catherine continued his ministry. Both of them sold out to Christ. Two very inspirational Americans who served this country well and who served God with distinction. The theme today is divine appointments. And I want to remind you that there's an appointment waiting for you to share your testimony. If you haven't been able to put that together yet, please work on it. The pastor is eager to receive your testimony, a piece of what God has done for you or a reflection on the whole journey you've made. This morning I want to talk a little bit about my beloved mother. My mom grew up knowing Christ, worshiping. She was raised in a convent, so she had great exposure uh, to faith. In fact, Uh, There were times along the way that she thought she'd become a nun, but that never did happen. Uh, Her faith tradition was Anglican um, Church of England in South Africa. But once my mom got married, she married a real rebel, my daddy. And uh, he wasn't a church-going man, and he wasn't very accommodating. And so along the way, my mom lost her connection with God still believed in God, still prayed, but wasn't a worshiper, kind of what we call backslid. And surprising that my brother Mike came to know Christ 
and uh, had this call on his life, but was not possible to pursue that call. He had only made um, his 10th grade education before getting expelled from three different schools. So there was no way he could go to seminary over in South Africa, but God wonderfully opened a door for him to come over to America, finish his education, and uh, get ordained. And while he was here, he met Connie, here from Oklahoma. They got married. We weren't at the wedding, of course, but my brother was able to raise enough money to fly my mom over to America several months after their wedding. And I believe that was much more than an appointment to see Mike and Connie. It was an appointment with God. While she was here, of course, Mike was very involved in prayer meetings, in worship services. During the three weeks she spent out here, he was doing revival services. And after two weeks of being with my brother, my mom recommitted her life to Christ. And when she came back, she was changed. She was always wonderful. I don't think there's anybody that loves any better than a mother loves her children. And she sure loved us. She loved me. But when she came back and her heart and life was right with God, a whole new part of my mom emerged. And I've told you, she was the one who prayed for me and encouraged me and was worried about me making bad choices. Her appointment here in America, her return to God, her ministry thereafter, all a part of that special time when she came out here. And as a result of that, her prayers, my brother's prayers, I came to know Christ. It's wonderful how God touches us again and again until we awaken, until we get connected. And then through us, He helps touch others and get them connected. A whole series of connections that took place because of appointments God had with different members of our family. I am deeply grateful to say this morning that all six siblings came to know Christ. And mom and dad committed to Christ before they passed on into the next uh, world, the next afterlife. Don't take those appointments for granted. God has something special that he's achieving in your life. And once you're connected, he's going to use you, if you'll let him, to help connect others to Christ. We have opportunity now to give. We are still giving online. We're still dropping checks off at the church. We've still got that offering chest to minimize the possibility of infecting anybody. I want to thank each one for your faithfulness in investing into the kingdom of God. Each of us is encouraged to tithe, to give back to God 10% of what we've earned as a way of recognizing God as the source of all we have. And then we give for benevolence, for almsgiving, you might not know this, but our office is a very busy benevolence office. Connie is seeing people every day and often three, four, five people a day. They come to our church needing a gas voucher or a meal or an accommodation for a night or two. Maybe they need medications. Many come here because they need help with utilities. And our church is constantly helping people in crisis. We are a lifeline, and we are glad to be that. In fact, during COVID, when we had to shut the office, I know there were many who were struggling because we were an essential piece of their help along the way uh, whenever something unforeseen happened. So we give to benevolence as another opportunity to help neighbors in crisis. What's going down to Louisiana is just another expression of that. And then thirdly, we invest into evangelism. I'm very proud to say this morning that by the end of last Sunday, we had received enough money to buy the Boda Boda motorcycle for Pastor Casito Dotson. I called him on Monday. I couldn't get him. I waited two days. He finally had to recharge his airtime on his cell phone, called me back. And uh, we visited, and I said, Casita, I've got good news for you. 
A couple of months ago, you asked if possibly our church could help you with that Boda Boda, and I'm pleased to announce we raised the money. I'm going to be sending it to you this week. There was laughter and joy. His wife was sitting next to him, his three kids. They were ecstatic. Friday, I sent off the transfer. He'll pick up that money tomorrow and be able to get that motorcycle that will help him visit his members. But it will also give him a little income as he does Uber driving on his little Boda Boda motorcycle, making a little income. As pastor, he gets a little home that he and his family stay in, but he doesn't get any salary. Ever since coming back from Uganda, I've sent him money every month to help him feed his family. And now he will be able to generate a little income. He preaches on the streets. He visits his members. He leads worship. He's got a great heart. Mike, Connie, Cassie, Joe, and I, we were in his church the Sunday before we left Nakalanda. I got to preach there for them. Wonderful people. The kids, I can see them now on their knees praying during the worship service. We had worship under the tree with the school. You've never seen kids sing with any more enthusiasm than those kids dancing, singing, celebrating, knowing Christ. What a joy it is to invest in evangelism where others can come to know Christ in the way we have. So thank you for giving. The money is carefully used to promote the kingdom of God wherever we can. Our stewardship reflection. Father, once I had such big dreams, so much anticipation of the future. Now, no shimmering horizon beckons me. My days are lack luster. I see so little of lasting value in the daily round. Where is your plan for my life? You have told us that without vision we men perish. So Father in heaven, knowing that I can ask in confidence for what is your expressed will to give me, I ask you to deposit in my mind and heart that particular dream the special vision you have for my life. And along with the dream, will you give me whatever graces, patience, and stamina it takes to see the dream through to fruition? I sense this may involve adventures I have not bargained for, but I want to trust you enough to follow even if you lead along new paths. I admit to liking some of my ruts but I know that habit patterns that seem like cozy nests from the inside, from your vantage point, may be prison cells. Lord, if you have to break down any prisons of mine before I can see the stars and catch the vision, then, Lord, begin the process now. In joyous expectation, amen. Please stand with me as we sing together our doxology.
If our children will come forward, we'll have a children's moment. Loves me. Good to see each of you with us this morning. So glad to have you in worship. Today we're going to talk about appointments. So, what usual appointments do you have? If you've got an appointment, it's normally with a? Doctor. A doctor. Yes, we go to see the doctor. Maybe we're not feeling well. Mom and dad call, they make an appointment, we go see the doctor. Or once a year we go see the the dentist, if you've got a filling, uh -huh, he's got to go and get rid of that little bit of decay, put a, a filling, or if there's a tooth that's bad, he's got to pull it out, no fun. That's, an, that's not an appointment you look forward to because you've got to get some shots, and <coughs> I've had a few of those, not fun. But once a year, you have a very important appointment. Everybody has one every year. What do we call that? Once a year you get to celebrate your? Celebrate your once a year? Birthdays. Birthdays. That's a special point. I bet your mom, your grandparents have that day circled on the calendar. That's a birthday. And when it's your birthday, you get birthday cake. You get candy. You have friends over. You get presents. Maybe some moolah. Uh -huh. Anybody like to open a card and there's a $5 bill or a $10 bill, a 20 Woo-wee! That's exciting, huh? And Christmas is an appointment, right? What happens at, at Christmas? What normally happens on Christmas Day? Presents. That's a strange thing, you know? It's the birthday of Jesus, Christmas. But we get presents. How does that work? Who should be getting presents? Jesus. So I hope you give him worship and thanks and give him a present as well. But all of us get presents on Christmas. What a wonderful expression of God's love. Jesus came. He was born here on the planet. And ever since we get presents. That's what God meant when he sent his son. Well, today I want to talk about special appointments with God. When you're at home and you have an appointment with God, it's the time you maybe read your Bible or mom tells you a Bible story, or you pray together. What do we call those times when we do that at home? Um, what is those things? Devotions. Say it. Devotions. Devotions. Those are special appointments at home with God. Or quiet times. We call them quiet times, where we read the Bible and we pray, and we remember that God loves us and we are His children. But when we come here like this, what do we call this? What are we doing here today? W w worship. Bump me. That's a special appointment. The people of God have been doing this as far back as we can remember. Coming together like this, a special appointment, Aaron, with God. To say, God, I remember. I come to sing. I come to pray. I come to hear your word. I come to be the man or woman, boy or girl, that you want me to be. Boy. boy. Are you boy? I think so. Let me feel you. Yeah, I feel those muscles. Now, listen now, listen. There have been people in the Bible that have had special appointments with God. When Adam and Eve did something bad, they hid away in the garden. But guess what? Who showed up? God. 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 Adam, where are you? Oh, it's God. I don't want him to see me. Adam, where are you? Ah, I'm here. <coughs> what are you doing, Adam? I'm hiding. You've never done that before. We're not playing hide and seek, Adam. We've come to visit. What have you done? 
I ate of the fruit, Lord. Oh, bad, bad, bad. We're in trouble now. God had to take care of Adam and Eve, and he's been taking care of us ever since. And as we read in our call to worship, Moses was out taking care of the sheep, and he saw a burning bush, except it wasn't burning up. It kept burning and burning, and he walked closer, and he said, oh, something strange going on here. And when he got close, whose voice did he hear? God's. Adam, take off your sandals. This ground is holy ground. And that's when God said, Adam, I've got an appointment with you. You're going back to Egypt. You're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go and worship me. Remember, that was the message. I want my people to go so they can worship me. And God has done that again and again. Special appointments. We're going to read about Philip. Do I need to tie your shoelace for you? Yeah, I'll do it. Good. It won't come loose. Don't, 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 don't. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, those are tickle you real good. <laughs> so, listen now. God wants to meet with you, help you, touch you, use you. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so glad for our quiet times, our devotions, our worship, those special times we hear from you, just like Moses did, like Adam did. Speak to us. Make us your boys and girls who love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said aloud. Amen. Amen. There will be candy for you at the end of the service after we are finished worship. Remember, we love you. You're special to us. We're in for a special treat today. Sandy has prepared special music for us, her and Matthew together.
That's one of my top 100 favorite spiritual songs. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. If you've never heard that song, it's beautiful. Look it up on YouTube. Draw me close to you, a beautiful worship song. Join me in our prayer for illumination as we ask God to take the scriptures and make them come alive to us as we read them together this morning. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please speak loudly and clearly to our hearts and minds today. Reveal your presence and your purpose vividly to us this morning. Help us to understand the gravity of being lost in sin and the urgency of being saved from eternal separation and death. Holy Spirit, please create divine appointments for us so we can share your love, goodness, and gospel. Amen. Our scripture comes from Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 26 to verse 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth, the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Some manuscripts include here that Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of questions for you to think about as we examine this passage. Maybe you can discuss them with the wife, the husband, the kiddos. Maybe you've got some friends that you can discuss these questions with. Number one, have you been prompted by God, just like Philip, to visit somebody, only to find it was just what was needed for their instruction, their benefit, or their encouragement? And if you have had that happen, give an example. Number two, have you received a call an email, a text, or a visit in person in answer to a prayer or a special need? Did you see it as a coincidence or as a divine appointment? 
And number three, will you ask God daily to set up divine appointments for you? Well, I want you to know this morning that this is a very special time of the year. I love the fall. I love the fall weather. I love the colors that are changing. I especially like the fall because hunting. And if you haven't picked it up by now, I am an avid hunter. I love the outdoors all my life. I've been involved in hunting and fishing, uh, canoeing, surfing, mountain climbing, camping. Those things are near and dear to my heart. And so whenever this change of season starts, I get excited. I get energized. You'll see me wearing camo quite often. And people ask me, are you going hunting? I'll say, no, unfortunately not. But this is my favorite outfit. I work in camo. When I can, I go hunting in camo. But often I'm just wearing it because I wish I was hunting. And when I put it on, it reminds me of what I love to do. Well, this is a special weekend because youth 17 and under get to hunt with a rifle, a special youth hunt, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Ethan and I have been preparing for the special youth hunt. You might ask, well, what does preparing for hunting look like? I'm glad you asked. You've got to have all the licenses and tags you need from the wildlife department. You've got to have the rifle and the ammunition. You've got to have a place to hunt. You've got to set up for the hunt, prepare. We have been doing a whole lot of prep work to make sure we were ready for Friday morning. Dark 30, I got up and I woke Ethan up, like five o'clock, got us ready. You have to wash, shower with scent-free soap. You've got to have your camo washed in laundry detergent that has no fragrances. You've got to have everything packed and ready so you can get out there in the dark and we were there in the dark. Ethan in the shooting house, me in the stand. We watched the beautiful sunrise. I took a picture. We looked and we looked and we looked. And guess what we saw? A lot of prairie, no deer. And if you don't know this, Friday morning was real cold, about 34 degrees cold. By the time the two hours had passed, Ethan and I, we were shivering, we were cold. We went and got ourselves a nice sausage biscuit. We drank a coffee. It was a good day, even though we had not seen anything. That afternoon, we went out again, and we looked, and we looked, and we, no deer. A lot of prairie, a beautiful sunset. The next morning, we went out again, dark 30. It was cold, about 41 degrees. <laughs> a beautiful sunrise. I took another picture. And even this time, he had a coyote real close. In fact, it came all the way to the shooting house. He made a cotton rabbit distress call. The coyote came looking for it right up to the shooting house, but he never did get to see it. Uh, clearly, it was there around the shooting house, and then it took off. We looked, and we looked, and we looked, no deer. A lot of prairie all around us we got out. And then when we went back in the afternoon, they were harvesting the circles of corn, and if you don't know this, if they harvest, your area is blown for any chance of a deer hunt. However, Aaron, we had heard about another spot that might be productive, so I called up Neil Hire. I said, Neil, our hunting opportunity is blown. Can we come and check that? Yeah, no problem. So Ethan and I went out. I was walking the ravine, the bottom. He was up on the high ground, up and down, up and down, in fact, when I jumped the first doe, Ethan was down because he had walked into some cactus and he'd got thorns stuck in his leg. When he looked up, the deer was already gone. He didn't even see it. I was pointing. <laughs> well, we kept walking, me in the bottom, about a mile. And when we finally got to the end, Ethan heard a twig. Looked up and guess what he saw? A doe. And we brought the dough home, and I was very glad. Even maybe a little happier than Ethan was. A successful hunt. Now, all of that exciting for somebody that likes to hunt. Maybe some others don't. But what is important for us this morning is it's an appointment. 
an appointment for a dad with his son. I have taken both my sons hunting and fishing. I've shared the things that I love. But more than that, we've spent time together. We have spoken and we have traveled together and we have reminisced and we've had a wonderful weekend together, a special appointment. Somebody has said this, teach your son to hunt and then when he gets old, you won't have to go hunting for him. You build those relationships, you teach those values that are important, that build connection with God, that build character. I've had wonderful opportunities to teach life skills to my sons while we've gone hunting and fishing, while we've been out camping. I've not only done it with them, I've done it with many others. Almost every year I've tried to find somebody that doesn't know hunting or fishing or the outdoors, and I've taken them with me to share that. And in the sharing, we build friendships. We make memories, special appointments that build relationship and intimacy. And now I must remind you and maybe challenge you that God longs for appointments with you and me. They're not those scary appointments like you have with a dentist or like me who had to go to the principal's office and get a little correction. No, these are loving appointments where God wants to awaken us spiritually, where God wants to grow us and make us a part of his family, where God wants to prepare us for life and eternity. And if you make those appointments, if you'll keep them, you'll be so thrilled you did. Just like the memories that Ethan and I have made, Reese and I have made, just like our lives together, our love for each other, your love for God, your relationship with God grows with each appointment, each devotion, each time of prayer, each worship service. When your heart is in it, when you're looking forward to that time together, our text tells us that Philip was in the midst of a revival. Remember, they'd been persecuted. They had to flee from the persecution, from the arresting and the killing. And he landed up in Samaria, the last place any Jewish person wanted to live or have to minister. But he was shocked to find that God was at work in Samaria. And then in the midst of what was a revival, God gives him a strange instruction. I want you to leave the revival and I want you to go to this lonely desert road. Now, if he's anything like me, I would have said, now God, now's not a good time. Things are really happening right here. We're in the midst of services. I've got a list, a long list of tasks. I don't want to be running off to that lonely desert road. I remember when I first came into ministry, I was very organized, task driven. I had long lists of things to do. And whenever God would mess up my plans, it would be irritating. I'd say, Lord, I, I couldn't get all the things done I wanted to have done today because this person came and that happened. And the Lord made it very clear to me, son, I am the list. I am the task. You're my son. You're my servant. When I say go, you go. So now I look for the interruptions. I look for the unexpected. I ask God to set up some divine appointments. I still make a long list. But when the Lord has something in mind, I say, here we go. It took me a while to learn that. And I guess Philip must have said, Lord, okay, we'll be off to that lonely desert road. And when he got there, guess what he found? A eunuch in a chariot. Coincidence? I think not. And when he got close to that chariot, he heard him reading the Bible. Coincidence? I think not. And then when he asked the fella, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand? No. I wish I had somebody to explain it. Ooh, guess what? I'm just the guy to help explain it. Well, come up here. And while he's up there, he shares the good news. And it just so happens that the eunuch is ready to surrender his life to God. He's so ready that when they come to water, he says, I'm ready to be baptized. Can we go ahead? Sure, we can go ahead. Bloom. And all of a sudden, God says to Philip, I've got another spot for you. Azotus, off you go. The eunuch is on his way back to Ethiopia. Now, we believe that because of this appointment, all of Ethiopia was exposed to the gospel, that Ethiopia was evangelized because Philip heard God and did what he said 
and met with the eunuch, and the eunuch gave his life to Christ, and through him and his witness, many others came to know Christ. It works the same today. God wants to meet with you, speak to you, touch you, awaken you, connect you, and then the big work is done. You're in the family. Listen to me, church. Not everybody's in the family. If we don't have a living faith and we are not connected to Christ, we are not in the family. Even though we belong to God, we have wandered off and we've got lost. God has to reconnect us. God has to adopt us back into the family. But once he's done that, the big work is done. Then he wants to use you to help others connect and come alive and be a part of the family. So don't be surprised when the Lord gives you a little tap on the shoulder and says, I want you to go and do that. You know, what? Yeah, go. Well, I've got a list. I don't care about the list. I want you to go. I am the list. Well, I was trying to do things for you, Lord. Well, right now, I want you to put those aside and I want you to do this thing because this is the important thing. Okay. I've told you the story. I was new to the faith. I was sitting in worship like this just minding my own business, and then the Lord give me a little tap. There's a lady sitting in front of me, two pews away. I want you to go and tell that lady I love her. No. We're singing a hymn. I'm not doing it. I don't know the lady. She'll think I'm weird. <laughs> then it came back again, strong. I want you just to go and tell her that I love her. I said no. Man, it came back a third time. I was almost shaken. I said, okay. And I stepped out. We were near the last stanza. I just tapped her on the shoulder. I said, God says he loves you. The lady started crying. I went back to the pew. I said, Lord, I told you it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I really did. As soon as they, that was the benediction time, they're going to pray. As soon as they did that, I left the church. I was leaving. I said, I don't want to be around. She came running after me. She said, when she caught up with me, why did you say that? I said, I'm sorry, I didn't want to say it. She said, no, no, I'm so glad you said it. Why did you say it? I said, man, I just sensed the Lord saying I needed to do that. I'm sorry, I don't know you. I didn't want to do it, but it's like you wouldn't let me go. And so I said, well, I'm so glad you did. She said, I've been sitting here the whole service wondering if God is real and my life is in such a bad place. I've really thought about ending it. I don't want to go on. And I said to God, God, I need to hear you today. I need to know what to do. I said, well, I'm, then I'm really glad I said what God asked me to say. That was one of my first experiences of really kind of stepping out into something that seemed weird. Sometimes it'll seem a little uncomfortable or weird, but it's a God moment. It's a God appointment. And I hope you and I will become more and more comfortable with those. One more story before I end. I had a friend at work. We got acquainted. I didn't know him real well. We had lunch one day. I remember so vividly, we ordered a nice big steak. Whew, you know, we love that meat like at Honey's, huh? A big old steak. When they brought me my steak, it tasted like liver. I don't like liver. I called the waiter over. I said, hey, listen, something wrong with this T-bone steak. It tastes like liver. Oh, no, sir. I said, oh, yes, sir. I know a liver, and this tastes like liver. You go back to the chef, you ask him what happened. He came back, he said, sir, very sorry. The chef was cooking liver and your steak next to each other. I said, I, I could taste it. Don't worry, sir, we're going to make you another steak. Oh, good, good, good. We got to visiting, and this friend, this colleague, asked me a little bit about my faith, and I told him how I came to know Christ and what he'd done in my life. And by the end of lunch, he said to me, Dave, I'd like to give my life to Christ. And I prayed with him right there over the lunch table. Now, I wasn't expecting it, but I was ready. I was glad to do whatever the Lord gave me opportunity to do. The same will happen in your life again and again as you and I ask God to use us wherever he can. I believe Don and Sybil Heiss, as they go off to Louisiana, are on a divine appointment to go and share his love and goodness with those folks. Who knows what all will happen on the way. And right in your neighborhood and right where you work and in your circle of friends, God has lots of opportunities to use you and me, just like he did Philip. Don't read the Bible and say, oh, that's way back there, that, those folks, not God doesn't do that for me. He does, if you'll pay attention. 
if you'll ask him to, if he'll find you willing and able, he'll put you in. Like any good coach, if he's got a good athlete and that athlete's got a big heart and he wants to serve and the coach says, do you think you can get it done? Yes, sir. Well, I'm gonna put you in, go get it done. Be that kind of person. Say, Lord, sometimes I'm a bit nervous. Sometimes it's new, but I'm eager. Put me in and guess what? You'll find he will more and more and you'll get comfortable speaking on his behalf, loving on his behalf, serving on his behalf just the way Philip did. He had no idea he was going to baptize that day, but he did. He had no idea he was going to witness that day, but he did. He had no idea he was going to open up Ethiopia that day, but we believe he did. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for appointments with our wife, our husband, our kids, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, but best of all with you. We are your temple. We are your witnesses. We are your servants, and we say, Lord, we're ready, willing, and available. Send us where you need us. Help us to speak up on your behalf. Help us to give and love and serve the very best we can. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Let's, Let's all sing, Where He Leads Me. This is the moment in worship where you say, so what? So what, we've sung a few songs and we've prayed a prayer or two and we've heard some scripture. What is that all gonna mean to me? What does that do for me? 
Well, I hope it will do a whole lot in your life and mine. I hope that you'll be touched, awakened, connected. I hope that your faith in Christ is a living faith and that you'll be able to say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Send me. I want to be a blessing. Wherever you can use me, use me. And I don't care what your situation is, whether you need to use a text or an email, write a letter, make a phone call, reach out to a neighbor. You let your light shine wherever God has placed you. I think somebody said it best. Bloom wherever you are planted. No matter what stage of life you're in, I pray that you'll be like Philip and go when the Lord asks you to. We're going to sing Majesty, Worship His Majesty, a song to prepare us for intercession. Each worship experience has a time of intercession as we pray for the needs of others. Let's sing together. Lord, your people today say thank you. Thank you for divine appointments, the way you met with Adam and Eve, the, may, the way you met with Moses at the burning bush, the way you met with Pharaoh when Moses came and confronted him, the way you met with Samuel when he finally learned to know your voice and said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The way you met with Daniel Shadrach and, Amish, and Meshach and Abednego right there in the furnace. The way you met with Nebuchadnezzar and Belteshazzar. The way you met with each of the prophets all the way into the New Testament when you showed up wearing our flesh and we all got to meet with Jesus, son of the living God. Thank you for Saul as he met with you on the Damascus Road, that divine appointment that changed his life. And all the many he was able to witness to that came to know you. Timothy that worked with him and Luke, the physician. Silas. Lord, a whole host of witnesses along the way. Thank you for Philip and the eunuch. And today, Lord, we want to say thank you for meeting with us. For every appointment, those we've met and those we've broken along the way. I pray that we'd be alert to your promptings and your voice. Thank you for meals enjoyed and the clothes we wear. Thank you for the homes we live in and the people who love us and whom we love. Thank you for hobbies, pursuits that fill our days with joy, golf and shopping and hunting and fishing and gardening. Lord, thank you for all the many pleasures of life. We are grateful. I pray for our president, our first lady. I pray for our elected leaders. Help them to be men and women of integrity who love this nation, who make good choices, who lead us down the path of righteousness. As we head toward an election, help us all to be well-informed, prayerful. Help us to show up and vote. We pray for good, godly leaders, smart, courageous to lead us in this great democracy of ours, Lord. Thank you for the 
men and women who have served us all these many years, our warriors, our first responders, our law enforcement officers. Bless them richly, Lord. Lord, I pray for those in the nursing home in the manor and the heritage that feel so lonely and discouraged. Be with them, touch them today, especially Bernice that we celebrate with her needle point, especially with Lois Boston, 107, soon to be 108. Lord, bless her. All the many out there, as I get to visit them this week with special permission, help me to be an encouragement. Lord, we pray for those suffering with COVID, that you'll touch them. Be with Lanny, who's recovering. Give him health and strength. Keep Neil Hire safe. Be with Patsy Ayers as she deals with her kidney failure. Lord, there are just many who are grieving the loss of loved ones, many who are feeling desperate because of pressures on their life, financial pressures, marital pressures, kids that are out of line. Lord, be with us. We are looking to you. Our hope is in you. As we join our voices and pray the prayer you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing a beautiful hymn of discipleship called Rescue the Perishing. Let's stand together and sing that with real fervor. The benediction today is a historic benediction. It's called the apostolic benediction. And as you leave worship and go into the mission field, I pray that this benediction will be both a challenge and a blessing to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.